And stations now the final time check before the start of hour number one of the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. 30 seconds until hour number one from Mark. That was our final verbal time check for the Line of Fire with Dr. Michael Brown. We'll have a long tone at 10 seconds before, followed by a short one at five seconds. Have a great afternoon, everybody. We've been warning you for a reason. It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, activist, author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, thanks so much for joining us on The Line of Fire. Michael Brown. Now, I have been sharing warnings for years now about things coming. Many of them have come to pass. I don't think you needed to be a prophet or a rocket scientist to see it, but we've documented it. We've put it out. And so I'm sounding the alarm even more clearly today about the bullying, about the silencing that is coming unless we speak up and hold our ground. All right, here's the number to call. 866-34-TRUTH, 866-34-TRUTH. If you have been bullied because of your views, you hold to conservative biblical views, you hold to conservative political views, you may just be a Trump supporter or you'll be a Biden supporter for all I know, but I think most of the attack comes from the other side on, on these issues. In the workplace, social media, school, if you've been harassed, if there have been attempts to silence you, I'd love to hear from you. 866-348-7884. Let me give a little context here. I came to faith in Jesus as a Jewish teenager, heroin shooting, LSD using, hippie rock drummer, 16 years old, had a radical, dramatic salvation experience, got rid of drugs by God's grace overnight, and have been following the Lord ever since. So it's late 71 until now, so going on 49 years by God's grace. So I, I lived a crazy life for a couple of years. I mean, drugs, as much as you could take in a human body, I did it. Everything you could do, I did it. Did other crazy things, broke into a couple of houses, doctor's office with a friend just to do crazy things. So all that known, my testimony known publicly. And many years later, got to witness to a woman and told her, yeah, I broke into your house years ago. <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, literally happened. Um, so that's all part of my testimony. And I was as crazy as I could be and thought I was cool in doing it. But, and, and obviously there were things that were ungodly and immoral in my life, but in terms of, of sexual brokenness, homosexuality, gender confusion, that was never part of, of the issues in my life. So... I never had a particular burden to reach people who struggled with homosexuality. Never had that as a focus in terms of what was happening in the society. I preached holiness uh, to this day. My whole life preached holiness, seek to live a, a life pleasing to the Lord. But uh, I was preaching in terms of heterosexual issues, you know, lust and, and adultery and temptation and pornography and just not thinking about homosexual issues. If it was part of my story, it would be part of my story. It's not. But beginning in 2004... God started to really burden me about LGBT activism. So please hear me. I would not have been speaking about this and writing about this through the years if it was just a matter of what people did in private and sins they committed and choices that they made and relationships they had. I would talk to them like any other person that needed the Lord and tell them in the Lord there's a better way and the need to turn to him. All right? I would not have made an issue of this or made a fuss about this if not for the very real and public agenda that has transformed our nation for the worse in these last 20 years or so. I wrote a little bit, talked about it a little bit. If you'll go through all of my writings prior to 2000, well, 2011, when I first wrote a major book on it, you'll see maybe all the stuff I said about homosexuality, maybe a full of page, page and a half. That was in 19 books and other writings, okay? 
So it's, it's only by God burdening me about these things that I began to talk about LGBTQ activism. And then once I was beginning to talk about the activism, God began to burden me for the people. So the way it's on my heart, the way the Lord spoke it to me was reach out and resist. Reach out to the people with compassion. Resist the agenda with courage. And obviously you need compassion in reaching out because people feel hurt and rejected. They feel rejected by the church, often rejected by their family. And, and, the, and the moment you, you talk to them about gay, lesbian, transgender issues, there can be great sensitivity, which I, I can understand from their part, you know, and, and so there needs to be great compassion and love. On the flip side, when you stand against the agenda, you need a lot of courage because you will get attacked. You will get attacked. So as God began to burden me about these issues in 2004, and I began to study and learn more, immediately I saw certain things. It, it was just clear as day from what I was reading and from what I was seeing and experiencing and sensing in my own heart. And in, in my 2011 book, A Queer Thing Happened to America, 700 pages, 1,500 endnotes, and we're actually looking at doing an updated edition for, for the 10th anniversary. It's a big, big project, but we're actually looking at doing that. In any case, I put some warnings in there. I had been giving these warnings years prior, but they're in writing as of 2011. I, I want you to hear some of what I warned back then because I'm going to give warnings now about what's coming. And it's primarily, in, well, it touches on gay lesbian issues, but that's not the big thing in terms of what's coming, in terms of our need to wake up, stand up. All right, here's what I wrote in 2011, but again, had been saying this for years prior to this. First, gay activists came out of the closet Second, they demanded their, quote, rights. Third, they demanded that everyone recognize those rights. Fourth, they want to strip away the rights of those who oppose them. Fifth, they want to put those who oppose their rights into the closet. <clears throat> now, when I first began saying that, I got mocked. I'd be doing these secular radio interviews about, no one wants to put you in the closet. What are you talking about? But then, then... Not long after that, a few years later, people began saying, bigots like you belong in the closet. I was on one Christian TV show, and I mentioned that an attorney friend of mine said, let's take it one step further. Gay activists used to be put in jail for, for standing up. We're going to get put in jail for standing up. When I said that, I said, here's what a friend said. I got mocked, articles written, you know, online shows mocking me and all this. And sure enough, it's happened. It's, it's happened. Check out Kim Davis, uh, among others. A and the thing is, when she was jailed for re refusing to issue the same-sex marriage license as per the judge's order, and there is no reason for the judge to do that. There are plenty of, of other ways things could have been done, uh, could have been done better in religious exemptions in Kentucky and all of that. Never should have happened. But when she stood firm based on her conscience, there was national uproar. Yeah! She calling her ISIS, and she deserves to be in jail. The very people tell me it's never going to happen. They're cheering this on. Well, you see? You see? She deserves it. <clears throat> so here's, here's the point. From the gay activist perspective, hey, they just want equality. They just want to live their lives. They want to be equal Americans. My relationship with my wife, Nancy, is valid. Why isn't their relationship with their partner valid? If, if I can be out and proud, you know, in, in any situation with, you know, with, with my heterosexual wife, you know, and, and here we are, a heterosexual couple, and it's, it's perfectly acceptable. It should be the same, just as acceptable for a homosexual couple. I understand from their perspective, they just wanted, they thought it was equality, quote, tolerance. But the reality is that it's an agenda that wants to put all opposing views in the closet. I, I mean, and now we're having consistent cases with, with pastors, church leaders who, who have lost their standing, who have had to resign from denominations or whatever because of shifts, and basically you cannot oppose the agenda. All right, I, I wrote more. I wrote more. Here's what I wrote. Whereas homosexuality was once considered a pathological disorder, from here on, those who do not firm, affirm homosexuality will be deemed homophobic, perhaps themselves suffering from a pathological disorder. Whereas gay sexual behavior was once considered morally wrong, from here on, public condemnation or even public criticism of that behavior will be considered morally wrong. Did I tell you or did I tell you? Whereas identifying as transgender was once considered abnormal by society, causing one to be marginalized, from here on, those who do not accept transgenderism will be considered abnormal and will be marginalized. Hey, look, friends, you have J.K. Rowling, 
J.K. Rowling, uh, author of the, the Harry Potter books, so, so one of the best-selling authors of all time. And because she took issue with the statement that people menstruate and said, no, women menstruate. People don't. Women do. She's getting blacklisted. Blacklisted and, and, and opposed and maligned and people that were part of the same literary agency resigning. No, we can't be part of this. It's crazy. You have Jermaine Greer, famous feminist. She, she would disagree with me on point after point after point after point after point. She goes to speak at the University of Cardiff in Wales, and there's protest because she does not say that a transgender woman is really a woman. In other words, a man who identifies as a woman, she says this person's not really a woman. And, and they try to, to block her from speaking on campus. This is, this is how extreme it gets. Okay, I, I wrote more. Back in 2011, here's what I said. From here on, embracing diversity refers to embracing all kinds of sexual orientation, homosexual expression, and gender identification, but rejects every kind of religious or moral conviction that does not embrace these orientations, expressions, and identifications. From here on, tolerance refers to the complete acceptance of GLBT, that's the order they used to use them, lifestyles and ideology, in the family, in the workplace, in education, in media, and religion, while at the same time refusing to tolerate any view that is contrary. From here on, inclusion refers to working with, supporting, sponsoring, and encouraging gay events, gay goals, while at the same time systematically refusing to work with and excluding anyone who is not in harmony with these events and goals. From here on, hate refers to any attitude, thought, or word that differs with the gay agenda while gays are virtually exempt from the charge of hate speech, no matter how vile and incendiary the rhetoric, since they are always the perceived victims and never the victimizers. One woman, I believe another author, but she wrote a letter in support of J.K. Rowling and in the name of inclusion was dismissed. Whatever position she had, whatever she was doing, she was dismissed in the name of inclusion. Years ago, I, I, I wrote to a company encouraging them not to participate in the controversial event. So why don't you just stay neutral on, on, in the culture wars? You're a secular company. We're not asking you to put Bibles in your store, but why not stay neutral in the culture wars? And, and, and you know what the response was? Well, we're standing with all the members of our community, and, and you were inclusive. I said, okay, great. Would you sponsor an event we're doing? It's a pro-family event, et cetera, et cetera. They wrote back and said, no, we will not work with you because we are inclusive. Talk about double talk. This was years back. Double speak, double talk. That, that's the meaning of tolerance, diversity, inclusion. It's the exact opposite, friends. But listen, this is just the preliminaries. Where we are today, this is mild. This is minor. What, what is coming down the pike now, what's already here and about to accelerate, is more intense than you can imagine. And, and if we don't speak up and stand for what is right today and hold to our convictions in the public square, i said it many times before, I'll say it again, we're going to have to apologize to our kids and our grandkids, starting quickly. All right, I'm going to play some clips for you that are going to shock you when we come back. Stay tuned. So what about the black Hebrew Israelites, or as they sometimes call themselves, the Hebrew Israelites? Are they a dangerous cult? Oh, yes, absolutely. You might have some who are very mild in their views, who simply believe that as blacks, that they are the original descendants of Israel, and they preach salvation through Jesus like anyone else. Okay, that's fine. But the ones that you find on the street corners, the ones that you find aggressively putting forth their message, they are full of hostility. They are full of hatred. They are bigoted. They are Jew haters. In other words, someone like me, they claim that we are the manifestation of Satan, that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. Many of them do not preach the Jesus of the scripture in any real respect. They preach a cult figure, Yeshua, or whatever name they give to him. And they would say that basically all blacks are the original descendants of Israel. So are there 
black Jews. Yes, absolutely. Like there are white Jews. Are there black Israelites? Yes, just like there are white Israelites. But are all blacks the descendants of the people of Israel? No, of course not. Categorically not. That is not so. That's part of their false teaching. Many of them are thoroughly legalistic in their teaching and then add in other customs. They are a cult. They are dangerous. They're spreading. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He had this concern. He said this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. There is something happening now with the Hebrew Israelites, with the black Hebrew Israelites, especially in inner cities, especially in different uh, African-American communities in America, where they are gaining more and more following. But because they bring people into bondage, not freedom, because they practice hate and promote hate rather than love, because they preach another Jesus, when we bring the real message of truth and liberty and salvation through the Messiah, not through a white Jesus, but through the biblical Messiah, they'll find liberty. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into The Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. I don't know if you've heard the latest, but Facebook is banning ads that talk about change possibility for those with unwanted same-sex attraction. They call it conversion therapy. But if you're a same-sex attracted person, say, you know, I, I want to get to the root of this. I, I'm not happy with this. I'd, I'd like to be in a heterosexual relationship either for biblical reasons or moral reasons or social reasons or whatever. Um, they're blocking that. And I'm, I'm in a chain now, each chain of, of different groups involved with this, conservative activists and others. And they're telling me, yeah, my, my Facebook page just got blocked. Yeah, these are ministries, organizations. Yeah, my Facebook page just got taken down. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, out, it's completely outrageous. It's completely outrageous. And, well, you shouldn't torture children. No, we're not torturing children. We don't believe in shock treatment. Of course we don't believe in shock treatment. Correct. We believe in sitting and talking with people and helping them get to the root of issues in their own lives. It's called counseling with professional counselors. In state after state across America now, it's illegal for minors to go with unwanted same-sex attraction. Let's just say you're a 17-year-old girl. God forbid. Let's say your situation you were sexually abused by a, a neighbor for years. Family didn't know about it. You were afraid to tell from the ages of 8 to 11. But it, you kind of became repulsed by men because it was a guy abusing you. And as you started to develop sexually and, and emotionally and come into puberty and all that, you, you just didn't want to be around men and then found more comfort in women. And then it's like, I don't, I don't want this. I, this conf I don't want this. I, I want to be married and have kids and so on. And you tell your mom and dad, and they say, well, look, we, we, we don't know how to help. This is a deep thing. Let's, let's get counseling for you. And, you, you know, you look up in your state, okay, you want a professional Christian counseling? Oh, that's illegal. What, what an outrage. Outrage. California last year almost passed a bill that would make it illegal for anyone of any age to get counseling. Gender identity confusion, same thing. I mean, it's completely outrageous. Censorship, nothing less than that. And in New York did the same thing, illegal for anybody. An Orthodox Jewish counselor went to court over this with the help of the Alliance Defending Freedom. And overnight, boom, New York reversed itself. I thought, what in the, what in the world happened? Well, what happened was, in this case, this is the fruit of, of good appointees by, by President Trump, the court that this would have gone to had new Trump appointees whose views were known where they'd come down on this, and New York just thought, well, we won't fight it, we're going to lose. They just backed off. But what, a, what, an, outra what an outrage. And, and what if you're a pastor and you want to give someone my book, Can You Be Gay and Christian? Is, is that going to be okay? I mean, these were questions that were coming up in California last year. <clears throat> so we're, we're dealing with extreme forms of censorship. But, but even this is just the beginning. You say, Brown, you're being paranoid. How am I being paranoid? We warned about these things years ago. They've been unfolding, happening in front of our eyes. As of this very day, they're happening. I just looked over on Facebook a little while ago and someone posted something from Anchorage, Alaska, said, hey, you need to see what's happening here. And the same deals with you know, trying to ban practical, life-giving, helpful counsel and then suppress those who've been changed. But let, let's look at the broader issues now. 
We have been shouting out at the top of our lungs that black lives do matter. We have been shouting out solidarity with our black brothers and sisters against racism, against injustice. We have recognized together that the legacy of the past from slavery to segregation has still left bad remnants in our society that we want to deal with. We've shouted that out as loudly as we can from the heart. Nothing new about that from the heart. And at the same time said we oppose the Black Lives Matter movement, the organization, the Marxist-led, queer-affirming, radical organization. Now, some very interesting information, and I want you to hear these clips from Bernard Carrick. Now, here's what's interesting. President Trump has gotten criticized for pardoning Roger Stone. And I don't know how these presidential pardons work. I mean, it's just like, I like the guy, I'm going to pardon him. I don't think it's fair, whatever. But they're controversial pardons with virtually every president. So this one with Trump, very controversial. Well, Carrick himself was, was, was pardoned uh, with, with removal of, of some of the negative baggage he had. He was a, a New York City police commissioner, and there were never charges of brutality or, or anything like that, but some misdemeanors and some he ended up in jail for some years, you know, tax event, whatever it was. He gets pardoned, but he's going to be talking about an even more controversial pardon from President Clinton, and this ties directly in with the Black Lives Matter movement. All right, so here he is being interviewed. Listen to what he has to say. Susan Rosenberg uh, is somebody that was convicted in 1985. Um, she possessed 640 pounds of explosives. She had been involved in a number of uh, criminal events in New York City uh, and the tri-state area. She was a member of the Weather Underground and the May 19th Communist Organization. Uh, she was sentenced to 58 years in prison. Um, and uh, she was also involved in, she was a getaway driver in a Brinks uh, armored car robbery in which two cops were killed and a, and a security guard was killed. Um, so she went to prison for 58 years and she was commuted, her sentence was commuted after 16 years by President Clinton on his last day in office. He let her out of prison. All right, so just so you understand, a lot of controversial pardons from different presidents, just to put things in context. So Susan Rosenberg, I mean, radical communist activist involved in violent crimes, police and so on. And what's the deal? Why is her name coming up now? Maybe she's a rehabilitated, transformed person. Well, Bernard Carrick goes on. Let's listen. She recently obtained a position uh, as uh, on the board of directors for a fundraising group um, that does all the fundraising or a substantial amount of it for Black Lives Matter. And, um, you know, the problem I have with this is nobody's really paying attention to the organization of Black Lives Matter um, in, in a much broader and bigger picture. So you have a terrorist, uh, a convicted terrorist, somebody that wanted the uh, overthrow of the United States government, somebody that um, was anti-capitalism, uh, anti-American back in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Um, she's now working for Black Lives Matter, whose founders, whose founders were inspired by a woman by the name of Joanne Chesimard. Joanne Chesimard, who today goes by the African name Asada Shakur, she lives in Cuba in exile after she executed a New Jersey state trooper and was involved in a number of bombings and uh, robberies back in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s, um, 60s and 70s, I should say. She was captured uh, in 1973 after she killed a trooper on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, she escaped from prison eventually in 1979, and she's been in Cuba ever since. That was She was the inspiration for Black Lives Matter. And you have a terrorist that was affiliated with her um, who does their fundraising. Again, we're talking about the organization. We're warning about the organization, but the organization is part of a larger cultural movement of mobocracy that wants to silence you, intimidate you, bully you. It's not just now gay activists who've gained footing in corporate America and Hollywood and so many other ways, and even though a small percentage of the population have such an influence over the society. We are talking about something much more widespread. And if you don't say it right, if you don't do it right, you may find yourself out of a job. You may find yourself threatened. I'm warning not to instill fear. I'm warning to say 
the antidote is that we speak up, that we're unashamed, that we stand together and do what is right, not with hatred or anger or violence, but with immovable truth, immovable conviction, backbone. As we said for years, we need hearts of compassion, backbones of steel. All right, one more clip from Bernard Carrick. What I see is somebody that was involved in law enforcement at that time. In fact, Susan Rosenberg, when she was convicted, I actually had to escort her. I was the commander of the Passaic County SWAT team. Um, I had to escort her to and from trial um, during that time. So as somebody that's been there, that lived through those times, I see history repeating itself. All right, so here's the thing. Here's the thing. Just like things happened in the 60s, upheaval, riots, shaking, some good causes, civil rights movement rising, just like some good causes now in the midst of things, but then the chaos, the riots, the generation gap, sex, drugs, rock and roll, gay liberation, radical feminism, all these other things, Eastern religion. What happened was that that became the dominant force in society, which is why we are the way we are today why we see the radical cultural shifts a generation or two later in front of our eyes. And I've been warning about this, but the shifts to come will be more dramatic, will be more extreme. The mo momentum is already here. The, the culture is already gone in dangerous directions. And it's not going to be one of those things of, hey, tolerance and freedom. You know, what was the old hippie slogan? You know, make love, not war, peace, man. You know, and the parents were saying, America, love it or leave it, you know, patriotic. And the young people, hey, man, make love, not war. But it did not have the intolerance. You, you had the radical groups like the Weathermen and so on. But now leaders from there, like Bill Ayers, become mentors of, of President Obama, mentors of, of leaders of, of Black, Life, Black Lives Matters movement and others. And, and I'm not into some conspiracy theory here. It's, it's just you got someone like Susan Rosenberg, and now she's with an organization that's fundraising for – for the BLM movement, friends, I'm talking about an avalanche of opposition coming the way of conservative believers, and we either stand and speak pastors, leaders, I don't mean getting political, I mean speaking the truth, holding to biblical convictions, holding firm, either that or we will lose the most precious fundamental rights that have been ours as Americans, I'm warning. We'll be right back. Okay, if, if there's one church, one body in God's sight, and if God works through local churches, that's his family, that's his body, right? What about parachurch organizations? What about ministries like, like this? Ask Dr. Brown. Yes, I'm part of a local congregation, right? But this is a, a ministry or a ministry like World Vision or something like that. Ministries like that. Parachurch. Is, is this part of the church? An evangelistic association. Look, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4 says this. It's written in Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Now, some would say, look, everything has to be part of the church body. There's one body, and it's expressed in local assemblies all over, and therefore, you have to be part of that. So if you have a parachurch ministry, it has to be part of a local church, and it comes out from that local church. Now, I respect that view. And I believe all of us should be part of assemblies of believers, unless it's impossible for us physically to join with other believers. We, we need to find other believers, join together with them, be in fellowship together. And everyone should have a structure of authority where they themselves are submitted to authority. And if you have a ministry and organization, that's submitted to authority. But, but, but I look at this really the exact opposite. We're all part of the body. We're, 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 all, we're all part of the, the body, the ecclesia, the, the church, if we're believers. So whatever I'm doing, S. Dr. Brown Ministries, that's just an extension of the body. The Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Samaritan's Purse, that, this is just extension of the body, different expressions of the body. So individuals, I mean, what exists are individuals. And as individuals, we are all part of the Messiah's body. 
and we are all should be on one level or another in submission to authority, okay? That's that's part of it. Every every one of us in that sense under authority, under accountability. And the same thing that whatever organization you have, just like a business, you're going to have accountability there and order and structure. But this is just an expression of my calling as an individual believer, just as Samaritan's Purse is an expression of Franklin Graham's calling or, or World Vision is an extension of one calling or Youth with a Mission, extension of, of the calling of Lauren Cunningham or Campus Crusade, which is now Crew, extension of the calling of Bill Bright. So this parachurch, and of course, the, even to call it parachurch, I understand what's meant. It's not, it's not an extension of just one local church, but come on, you're not going to have every local church creating all kinds of ministries that are going to go around the world. These are going to be things that we do jointly in a larger effort, all as part of the body, because there's only one body. So I think we're looking at this wrong. I think we need to look at everything as coming out of the one body, and as individuals, we're all part of local assemblies meeting with other believers. To me, pretty basic and simple. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Friends, being forewarned is being fore-equipped. Jesus rebuked the religious leaders of his day, <clears throat> Matthew, the 16th chapter, and said, you can tell what the weather's going to be by the sky, you know, the signs of the times. And I'm not talking about getting every prophecy lined up and every verse in the Bible lining up with a headline. I'm just saying we, we should understand and be aware of what's happening in the larger culture around us. 866-348-7884. Have you suffered bullying, intimidation for holding to your biblical views in the workplace, in your neighborhood, in your schools? It's a very challenging time for kids now, and, and they're getting overwhelmed with certain things and social media uh, material that goes out in, in, in all different ways, confusing them. And, and then when they just go against it at all, just the vitriol and the attack, kids, bad enough if, if it's adults, but kids. Here, so July 7th, Harper's Magazine publishes a letter, 150 intellectuals, authors, le influential leaders, and things like that, challenging the cancel culture, that if you dare differ with the politically correct words, then you will be canceled. You will be, you'll be obliterated, you'll be rejected, you'll lose your job, you'll lose your reputation, whatever. There's a great op-ed in the Washington Times by Oz Guinness, leading Christian thinker. And he says, Harper's letter against cancel culture is welcome and overdue. And there's a key sentence in the article, the free exchange of information that ideas the lifeblood of a liberal society is daily becoming more constricted. And, and he says this, listen, the next step, Os Guinness, the next step must be to go beyond the concern for the cancel culture and call for a thorough examination of all the major differences between the ideals of the American experiment and the claims and demands of the progressive left. In essence... America's choice is between the ideas and ideals of 1776 and the American Revolution versus those that have come down from 1789 and the French Revolution. And, and one brought about tremendous and profound change that continues to develop in positive ways. The other brought about death and destruction for so, so many. You dissent off with your head. Remember, the one chopping one day is probably the one that's going to get chopped the next. Everything reproduces after its own kind, and soon enough, you end up being canceled. You'd never be too secure when the cancel culture runs amok. <clears throat> Let me just give you another example. All right, CEO of Goya Foods. I don't think I've ever had Goya Foods. Plenty of foods I've never had. But is it the largest company or food company owned by a Hispanic CEO. In any case, very popular, successful company. And the CEO of the company speaks well of President Trump. All right? Now, now look, you can have different political views. Everybody does. Okay? You can, you can be a supporter of President Obama and someone doesn't like that, and you speak well of him, and they, people call you a jerk and this and that. 
or you speak well of President Trump and people don't like that and call you a jerk and people get nasty with each other. That's the world we live in. You go to sports event, you know, fans get nasty. It's a nasty world. Okay. I wish it wasn't like that. That's the way it is. We can do better, but that's the way it is. But you, you don't call for a boycott of the person's product because they speak well of the current president. What is that? That's mind control. That's thought control. That's saying you don't dare put forth an opinion that we don't like. You're talking about the president, the one that was duly elected by the Electoral College, by our rules, the president of the United States, supported by roughly half the country. And you're going to speak well of him, and now someone's going to call for a boycott? And it's it's someone in in, in Congress? Uh, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? But but look at this. Look at this tweet from Julian Castro. He, He was formally with uh, uh, Housing and Urban Development, HUD, right? I believe that's where he served in the government and is what currently mayor of San Antonio. So he's a serious player. Look at what he says. Free speech worth works both ways. Goya Foods CEO is free to support a bigoted president who said an American judge can't do his job because he's Mexican, who treats Puerto Rico like trash and who tries to deport dreamers. We're free to leave his products on the shelves. Okay, okay. Well, hang on, hang on. Yeah, free speech works both ways. But one is someone giving their opinion about the president and what they think the president is doing well. And the other is now threatening you with consequences. It's one thing if you say, I think the guy with Goya Foods is stupid. And I think he's betraying his own people as a Hispanic man. Fine, you have your opinion. But to then call for a boycott of the person's products you see, that's, that's the thing that's amazingly unequal here. Are, are you serious? Here, how about this in case you missed the news? I'm just devoting this day to sounding the alarm. <clears throat> Over the weekend, I read about two different cases. Now it turns out there were four different Catholic churches that were vandalized slash set on fire. Yeah, four of them. Uh, and, and statues of Mary that were defaced. Now, one had idol written on it. Listen, I'm not Catholic. I don't agree with Catholic theology of Mary. I don't like statues of Mary or Jesus for that matter. All right? But I understand. I understand that when someone's burning Catholic churches, I mean, unless there's some very specific, unusual thing happening, but if it's the broader thing that it looks like, this is an attack on quote, Christianity in the eyes of the people doing it. They're not going to say, oh, you're Protestant, we're not after you. Oh, you're Orth- Greek Orthodox, we're not after you. Or you're Pentecostal. No, this, when I see this, the attack on Catholic churches, I think that's an attack on all of us that profess Jesus' name. That's how it looks. And, and then during some of the marches and protests, remember synagogues vandalized. Some of the riots in, in, in recent weeks happened last month. And very little reporting on this. Friends, I'm talking about a mob, a mobocracy that could be marching into your neighborhood next. He said, it scares me. Jesus gives us the antidote. Don't fear those who kill the body but can't kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In other words, we only have to fear God. We love him, we respect him, honor him, fear him. We are his servants. It's, it's time we wake up and start speaking up, speaking out. Just read a, a letter from Barry Weiss. A New York Times editor, a Jewish woman, was hired about three years ago, and she was hired because of Trump's presidency. So the New York Times said, okay, let's have a little broader constituency. So her views were a little different. Her views were more conservative and so on. And, and she was harassed, bullied, called Nazi, finally resigned because of the terrible culture there where, where you cannot have an opposing viewpoint. You have an opposing viewpoint, and you'll be censored for it. Friends, it's happened for years in our college campuses. It's getting worse and worse and worse. It's happening more and more in newsrooms. I'm going to go to your calls in a moment, 866-348-7884. I'm warning. I'm warning. Please hear me. Please hear me. The things we warned about before have happened. And like I said, you didn't need to be a prophet or rocket scientist to see them coming. It's just like, okay, here comes the tsunami. You can see what's going to happen with it. <clears throat> but... I got a call a few weeks ago from a gentleman that had been on a, worked in an NBC affiliate for years, local NBC affiliate in, in one city in America. He was the only 
conservative Christian there in well over 20 employees working in his department. And, and now, now listen, I'm not primarily talking about speaking up for Trump. That is not my issue. I'm talking about speaking up for Jesus, speaking up for biblical values. I'm illustrating some things with Trump to show you the culture, okay? He said that there was a news report that was up about Trump that was blatantly false. He then went to uh, the projection manager, whoever it was, and said, hey, how come we're not pulling that story? It's been proven false. He said, the guy said to him, That's, my job is not to report truth. My job is to get rid of Trump. He said, crazy, why should I believe that guy? Well, I just talked to someone who worked with a CBS affiliate in another state. He said, I had to get out. We were on the phone talking. He said, I had to get out. He said, I'm, I'm in a, working in a different realm. He said, but the hostility against Trump there was so intense. There, there was no pretense of even trying to tell the truth. It was get rid of the man. Now, that's Trump. I understand. Trump is not Jesus. Trump is not Bible. I understand that. I'm just saying that that is the same type of environment that others have spoken of holding to biblical values. It has been there for years. It is growing. But now that it has turned into a Marxist mobocracy, it's real danger. So, hey, if you appreciate my voice and how we are here speaking without fail, without compromise, addressing the issues, by God's grace, regardless of cost or consequence, and yes, we get censored, and yes, we get blocked, and we keep hearing about our YouTube videos getting restricted. We've had to fight many battles, and thankfully, Facebook ended up backing us on key things and YouTube approving videos, but then restricting other things, and so the battle continues. We do our best to speak the truth in love, in wisdom, in non-inflammatory ways, but to get the message out. And we don't mind the mockery and the attack and the lies and the death wishes and the death threats. It's my calling. I'm called to be a lightning rod. If I can draw some of that heat away from you, so be it. But you can help by praying for us. You can help by sharing the broadcast with others. You can help right now on Facebook. If you're watching on Facebook, click on the donate button there. If you're watching on YouTube, click on the dollar sign beneath YouTube there. You're helping us directly beneath the chat box there. You can go to a website, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org. Click on Donate to stand with us. Friends, here's what it's like. You guys are like the, the bow and pulling it back, back, back. You need strength to do that. It, that's a task. And then I'm like the arrow. It gets shot out and my head is like the tip of that arrow. So I don't mind the impact and, the, and all of that. That's my calling. But I can, I can go further with more power with your help back again. So let's, let's do this together. Jesus said what, what you're told in secret, shout from the rooftops. Oh, he doesn't mean gossip. He means, hey, I'm, I'm sharing truth with you. All right, I'm, I'm just here with you, my disciples. I'm in a closed room or in this field here in this desolate area, and I'm telling you truth. Now that you know it, it's your job to go shout it to the world. It doesn't mean in an obnoxious way, but it means that we are witnesses. Can we count on you in the workplace, in your social media platforms, in your neighborhood, in your own family? Not to be nasty, not to be self-righteous, not to be mean-spirited, but without shame and without apology, say, hey, here's what I believe. I believe God's ways are best. Hey, here's where I stand, and here are the reasons for it. And you can hate me. I'm going to love you back. You can spit at me. I'm going to smile at you. But I'm not moving. I'm not moving from my position. And I'm going to take my stand. Let's do it, friends. Time's are urgent. All right, straight to the phones when we come back. What exactly is dominion theology? Well, it's understood in a couple of different ways. And in the first way, I categorically reject it. The second way, I differ with it. In Genesis chapter 1, God gives this commission at creation. God blessed Adam, speaking of 
Adam, representing Adam and Eve, God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And it is believed that this commission now makes its way into the New Testament with the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of the nations, and that it is the role of the church to take over, that it is the role of the church to take dominion over society, over government, over media, over entertainment, over education. It is the role of the church to take over. I reject that. I reject that theology. I do not find that in harmony with the preaching of the Bible or the teaching of the New Testament specifically. I reject dominion theology in that regard. I believe that we have spiritual dominion in Jesus over demonic powers. I believe in Jesus we have spiritual dominion over sin in our lives. But no, we do not take over the world. We usher in the return of Jesus through the preaching of the gospel, and he sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns. Now, there are others who are post-millennial who have a different view, that they believe through the preaching of the gospel over a period of time that the world will then submit itself to the will of God and the whole world will become Christian. And then after that, Jesus returns. People like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney held to post-millennial theology. Jesus comes after the millennium. I don't hold to that view personally, but I would separate that from the dominionist aspect of we're going to take over. I find that type of teaching and emphasis dangerous and something to be avoided and contrary to the spirit of the New Testament. And Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire, 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to the phone, starting in New York. Joseph, welcome to the line of fire. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you for all that you do uh, for the body of Christ. The, the fact that you stand strong and firm in our biblical principles and share that message through the years uh, to just explain to people what we're all about has been tremendous, and I appreciate that. Well, thank you, what sir. What I wanted to say is that right now we are facing times where censorship is at, a, is at an all-time high. Uh, recently, there was an article in the Washington Post from Governor Cuomo which stated that if you believe in pro-life, then you're just like a person who's a homophobe, a person who hates homosexuals. And that person has no place in the state of New York. I found that very interesting, very disturbing, but not unlike what has been going on in this country. Um, I want to say that just recently, you know, I am a pastor myself. Uh, I started a website called Religious Lives Matter. Of course, we know that all lives matter. Of course, we know that black lives matter. We know that the un unborn black child matters. Uh, which seems to be forgotten in this whole thing of Black Lives Matters. But more importantly, religious lives matter, and we need a place to share truth without fear of retribution from those in government. Now, we know it's coming. Mm -hmm. We know that the Bible tells us it's coming. Our voices will be silenced at one point. But I just praise God that Messiah will come back, and we will see vindication in our days. So just thank you for all that you're doing, Dr. Brown. Uh, I continue to pray for you and support your ministry. And I pray that you continue to be steadfast in love, sharing biblical truth. Hey, Joseph, thank you. Thank you so much for your efforts and for the kind words and prayer and support. And, and let me say this. Uh, I wrote an article yesterday pointing out that the term white supremacy is now being weaponized the same way that homophobe or homophobia was weaponized. So in, in, as the strategy developed a couple decades back and using the term homophobia, so if you say, you know what, I believe marriage is a man and a woman or a kid should have a mom and a dad, that's homophobic. Or, you know, now transphobic. I mean, these terms have been used for years and years. So the moment you have any difference with LGBTQ agenda, you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe. Now, if you have a difference of opinion, if, if you think Trump is a better candidate than Biden, you're a white supremacist. If you don't support every aspect of the BLM movement, you're a white supremacists. So what you gave as an example of Governor Cuomo is the same kind of thing. It's the labeling and the discrediting and discarding. Friends, when it comes your way, don't back down. But turn the thing around. I've done it to people and said, why do you seem so, you sound so intolerant? 
you, you sound so judgmental and intolerant. What are you talking about? It's like, well, I share an opinion and, you, you know, I turn the thing around. Someone was blasting me yesterday and, and, and telling me, you know, you just care about black babies in the womb and you discard them afterwards and you don't care. I said, what are you talking about? It's 100% false. Where'd you ever get that idea? And he says, well, you know, I'm not going to listen to any non-black person. And he's calling himself a Christian. I said, how would you like it if I just called you non-white? What's Christian about that? <laughs> Turn the thing around and push back with truth. Don't be intimidated. One of the unspoken mantras of LGBTQ activism for years has been, we will intimidate and we will manipulate until you capitulate. We have to say, we're not capitulating. We're going to love you. We're going to serve you. We're going to do everything we can to be a blessing in your life and bring you into the knowledge of the one true God, but we are not backing down or bowing down. All right, to the phones in Minnesota, Jesse, welcome to the line of fire. Hi, Dr. Brown. Hey. Well, okay, so my question is this. <clears throat> I actually live in Minnesota, and as you know, uh, that's kind of where the riot started and everything. Yeah. There was a lot of chaos going on. Uh, but I'm 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 not black. I'm white. I'm a male. Uh, I'm straight. W really, the question is, what can I really do? I mean, because the moment I would try to say something, I would get blasted with, "Well, you can't identify," and that sort of thing. Yeah. So uh, obviously, we're not trying to be anything that we're not, right? In other words, when I'm trying to prove, oh, I understand your background or your culture, your upbringing, or if that's not our experience, it's not. You know, one black caller yeah. said to me, Dr. Brown, you don't understand. You know, I was picking cotton at the age of five. I said, you're correct. I, how can I relate to that? I, I can understand. I can understand that I don't understand. But the thing is, yeah. num number one, if you believe a cause is a right cause, then you get involved because it's a right cause, not because you're trying to prove anything politically or show how woke you are. You know, if, if you believe, for example, that that uh, kids in the inner city were being neglected and needed mentors and you said, hey, can I sign up to show up to school once a week and hang out with a kid or play ball with them? Yeah, we, we welcome people to do that, you know. So great. You, you just do what's right because it's right to help. The other thing is people need Jesus and you know the Lord. And that's the biggest thing, Jesse. It doesn't matter what color you are, what background you are. And, and I pretty well guarantee you that that if someone's starving and, and you reach out a white hand or a black hand or a green hand or a yellow hand or a red hand with healthy food for that person, they'll take it. They'll see the food and the love as opposed to the color of the hand. So let's, let's give people what they need most, which is the gospel. And, and in other cases, if, if you feel something's important, you just tell someone, hey, I wasn't raised in your community or I don't have your background. Tell me your story and listen and learn and understand. And then Sort through what you feel is right or wrong. Hey, and thank you, Jesse. Uh, but again, you got the gospel. That's the biggest thing uh, of all. Hey, let me, let me just say this. <clears throat> I am not trying to prove to anyone that I am Mr. Loving or that I'm not racist or that I'm not homophobic or that, I mean, I, res I may respond if people falsely accuse me. I'm trying to please the Lord and honor the Lord and do my best to serve and help you. That's what I'm trying to do. So I know, I'm going to say a particular thing. Here, we've got, a, we've got a new article up from Am I Not a Man and a Brother to Am I Not, Am I Not a Baby and a Sister? And talking about the famous graphic, it was actually you know, a constructed thing. Now we call it a meme. There's a, there's a black man in chains. This was used so effectively beginning in the 1780s in England. There's a black man in chains. We've got it up on our screen for those watching. And it says, am I not a man and a brother? So to humanize this slave, to say this is not, this is not just a person from Africa that doesn't speak the language like a brute beast. This is a, a fellow human being who, who has feelings just like you and family and desires and goals. And Am I not a man and a brother? And that helped turn the tide because people realize that's a fellow human being. How can I enslave a fellow human being? How can I kidnap and bring over from another country a fellow human being? How can, what gives me the right to do that? And it changed things. And, and it's, the changes continued because through much of our society, blacks were still second-class citizens in certain ways and, and, and still in certain situations are not getting an equal shake. So, but the humanizing, that's the key thing, the, the humanizing. So I felt now that there is such an emphasis 
remembering the horrors of slavery better than maybe we've been willing to or how far back it goes or how deeply rooted it was, whatever, okay? And, and, and saying, hey, if there's racism, let's, let's expose it and deal with it. That this was a great time to say, let's, re let's remember in the midst of this that we're in the midst of another moral horror. And as bad as police brutality is and, and other things are, abortion is, is, mass, is massive, 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 massive. You take all causes of death, say just in the black community, because I look at this as an attack from Satan on African-Americans, okay? I, I look at this as, yeah, abortion in general, attack on the, on the coming generations. But because it's disproportionately high among black Americans, I, I'm not blaming black Americans. Everyone makes choices as accountable for God. I'm blaming the devil and society, okay? I see this as an attack by Satan on precious people with a calling of God in us. I've said this for years and years and years. <clears throat> All right. So what's the point of this? The point is that if you take every black cause of death in America, from accidents to heart disease, to pile them all up and abortion is higher. That to me is a satanic attack against precious people, world changers, the next generation that God wants to use getting wiped out. That's how I see it, okay? I see it as an attack on younger generation in general. But because of the disproportionate amount in the black community, I see this as the devil trying to attack you and rip you off and destroy you, my black friends, brothers and sisters. So I want it in the midst of people being stirred about this to make a statement saying, hey, what did we learn about slavery? Am I not a man and a brother? Let's apply that to the baby in the womb. And, and we've, got the, we've got the meme and, and there she is kind of swathed in pink. So, you know, it's a girl. Am I not a baby and a girl? Now, some might say, Dr. Brown, that's the wrong time because it's not the right time for the message. Hey, I got to do what I feel is right in my heart to do. In other words, I've, I've made my stand clear enough. I've, I've made my heart clear enough. I've made my life clear enough. You know I'm an ally and a friend and, and standing with you against injustice. And, and you know I have a listening ear when you call and say, Dr. Brown, you missed something. You have a blind spot here. Keep speaking to me from all different perspectives and backgrounds. Keep speaking to me. I'm a, I'm a lifelong learner in God. But I may say certain things differently than you'd like me to because I have to give account to God. And, and follow the burdens he lays on my heart. And as much as I'd like to make everybody happy, that's not going to happen. Paul said, if I yet pleased men, I wouldn't be a servant to the Messiah in Galatians 1.10. My grandson Andrew was asked to speak to his entire Christian school with a, a message via video, and the text he chose, 16 years old, Galatians 1.10, I thought, that is awesome. If I yet pleased men, I wouldn't be a servant of the Messiah. Friends, please God, love your neighbor as yourself. Serve whoever you can serve but make it your ambition to please God. Do what is right. This generation needs you to take a stand. I'm warning you what's coming, friends. We can turn it around if we do what's right and if we speak up without fear.